Hello, welcome to the James Cooley Show. It's your life. I'm your host, Dr. James J.C. Cooley. And wow, I tell you, I am so thrilled. I am so happy. I am so excited to have this guest on that I met, I think about a month ago. I had an opportunity to meet this uh, this great guest that we're going to have on tonight. And uh, just uh, chatting with, I met her through a friend uh, of ours. And, uh, and this friend said, hey, Dr. Cooley, you got to have her on the show. And so she introduced me to her, and I tell you, it's just been absolutely amazing. And uh, I am so excited to have her on to talk about, and which this topic is, I, I think it's so instrumental to all of us, is because we don't know where life is going to lead us. Uh, and sometimes we might not be in the greatest spot at the moment. Uh, but uh, sometimes I believe that we, in in my case, uh, I follow my Lord and Savior, and I let him guide the way. I didn't always, I wasn't always like that. Uh, but uh, if you believe in uh, whoever your high power is and you let them uh, guide you, you never know where life may lead you. <laughs> you know, so I'm excited about that one. And, uh, you know, I cannot start a show out without talking uh, first to my exec producer and also my co-host, Dr. Michelle Cooley. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. You know, I do remember when you were speaking to this wonderful guest, um, you know, you're just having a really great conversation and... Um, you know, she just she saw, she just was so full of life, and it was just a, a really great. Like you've known each other for a long time. She's very personable, um, from what I was hearing a couple of weeks ago when you were on the phone with, um, you know, your other friend, and um, you know, we 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 worked out a way to have her on the show, and you might take a couple of weeks, but we are really happy to have her. <laughs> You know, uh, so uh, wherever you wherever you listening to this show, wherever you watching it at, uh, I mean, whether you watching on E three sixty TV, Transverse TV, YouTube, what, whatever platform, over thirty plot, th over thirty plus live streaming networks, uh, welcome to the show. And if you have any comments, all you have to do is just go to the comments, ask this great guest any question you want, and uh, we promise we're gonna get you an answer. Uh, Dr. Cooley, can you do the honors and the pleasure of, first of all, telling our viewers and our listeners the title of the show, the purpose of the show, and then introduce this absolutely magnificent guest? Well, yes, of course. So the title of the show is called Where Life Has Led Me. And the purpose of the show is getting to know Australian politician and former leader of the Australian Democrats, Madam Cheryl Kernel, and talk about her early family life and education and her also discuss her path to federal parliament. We're gonna learn all about her legislative achievements and also what life is like since parliament, post parliament. So Madam Cheryl is one of the National Trust 100 National Living Treasures. She was leader of the Australian Democrats from 1993 to 1997 and the member for Dixon, and a Labor shadow minister from 1998 to 2001. Her political portfolios included, amongst others, Indigenous Affairs, Treasury, Employment, and Women's Policy. She played a significant parliamentary role in introducing compulsory summa annotation and native title. Post-politics, she spent seven years in the UK working in the pioneering policy area of social entrepreneurship and social impact at the School for Social Entrepreneurs in London and then at the Skoll Centre in Oxford University. On her return to Australia, she spent 10 years at the Centre for Social Impact at UNSW, delighting in teaching social change makers. So this woman, this, this guest today, she has, I mean, a, a hour will not do her justice, but we're going to try. So please welcome to the show, Madam Cheryl Cronaut. Madam Cheryl. <laughs> That's a bit of a big rap, you know. It's just, it's just my life. And, um, yeah, a life I've been so far pretty happy to lead. Wow. I tell you, Madam, uh, yeah, it's uh, extraordinary reading your bio and your curriculum vitae. And first of all, how, how does it feel to be one of the uh, hundred uh, Oh. Historian, I'm talking about in the world. I'm talking about, I'm talking about not, I'm not talking about just Australia. I'm talking about the world. I, I doesn't feel yeah. to be that. 
Well, I love it. I, I today today we're still part of the British Commonwealth, and today is a public holiday here. It's uh, King Charles's birthday holiday, even though his birthday is in November, and his mother's birthday was celebrated in June, even though her birthday I think was in April. So figure that out. Nevertheless, it's a public holiday. And on the public holiday, on the, the King's birthday, they publish a lot of honours for people's contribution to Australian life. I've never nominated for one or been nominated for one, but this National Living Trust, 100 Living Treasures, means more to me than that because this was voted for by members of the National Trust. Um, and, and I really cherish it. So there's only 100 and I think when you die, they elect somebody to, to make up the to make up the number. <laughs> well, but that's not going to happen no time soon. And, uh, and and you know, I tell you, just uh, getting an opportunity to chat with you, just uh, through our friend. Uh, hopefully, she'll come on tonight, Ambassador uh, mm -hmm. uh, Olivia, uh, and uh, and she just told me. Dr. Cooley, you got to meet her. And I said, okay, yeah, I'd love to meet her. Next thing you know, she had you on the phone. <laughs> and, well, it's amazing that I'm here in Australia talking to you at a, at a time that works for both of us and about uh, different systems. So I'm hoping to be able to translate my Australian experience into some American uh, equivalent language for your viewers. Well, well I, I had an opportunity. Uh, to live in Australia for three years, and mm -hmm. and uh, I, it was just amazing. And you're there, and it's completely, totally different than the world that we live in in the United States. But I'm, I'm, I'm talking about we're small. Was that because we're small? Is no, it's no? the cultures. It's it's the uh, the it's it's not just because of small. I know you guys are two thirds the size of the United States, uh, but uh, I think when I was there, like 20, 20 million people. Well, we're up, really up to, we're up to 24, going on for 25 yeah, now. But yeah, still, yeah. it's a lot of land for, we all hug the coast mostly. But I just had, <laughs> yeah. but I, I just had so much fun. I'm talking about, um, and when I was there, I was in the military, but I had an opportunity to uh, work with and, and meet a lot of the indigenous uh, folks mm -hmm. that was there, mm -hmm. uh, especially the Aborigine yeah. uh, Indians. I had a chance to go fishing with, I had a chance to learn. Uh, mm. from them and it was just uh it was amazing mm. how nature how 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 they cherish the nature that's there i'm talking about for its survival for its everything for its what was taught to them it was just so amazing and, they have uh, teach us at the moment um we've had a lot and you've had them too and canada's having them bushfires huge mm. bushfires um I'm not a climate change sceptic, I'm a believer. I see it happening all around me. But finally, we've started listening to the wisdom of Indigenous people in how to maintain um, bushland in between the hot seasons uh, that we, we experience. It's taken a long time, but um, I think it's finally an accepted um, way of looking at disaster management now in a new way. Oh yeah, and I think uh, we can learn from the people uh, that uh, knows how to combat certain mm -hmm. things because we think that we know how to do these things and we only know a tip of it. Absolutely. We've got the longest continuous uh, inhabitants, I think, of indigenous world anywhere in terms of with over 60,000 years here in Australia. Absolutely. We're going, we're going to talk a little bit more about that. But, uh, uh, Madam, can you tell our viewers and our listeners, what was it like growing up in, in Australia? Look, I'm lucky to have had a fabulous um, childhood, one of four children. My parents were not wealthy. My father worked uh, an extra job at night. And we, we did not have extras but we had enough everything we needed my parents were able to um, be careful with money and to survive and my father um, got a, a block of land in a ballot uh, it was leasehold so not freehold and he was able to build a beach shack 
And every weekend and every school holidays, our family would go there. There were very few families in this particular at this beach. And as a child, from say eight onwards, uh, we had the run of the beach with about four other families, this huge crescent of sand and sparkling, sparkling clean salt water and clean air, um, lots of friends to play with. Look, it was, I'm really, really lucky. It was the most wonderful, wonderful childhood. We were secure, we were loved. And Australia is a sunny place. Um, there are lots of things wrong with us, like everywhere else. But the, I noticed when I lived in London and it was dark early and it was a bit bleak and people were all shoved into the tube, Australians are accustomed to sun and space. And I don't know whether that means that we have sunny personalities or not, but it's very much a part of our national psyche being practically, well, reasonably near the coast and having lots of sunshine. Wow. Yeah, so what was uh, some of the lessons that uh, that you live by today that your, your parents taught you that, uh, Cheryl, uh, this is what I believe that you need to focus on? Can you tell our viewers and listeners a little bit about that? Yeah, well... Um, when we were, we didn't get our first car till, oh, I can't remember, I think I might have been 10, maybe. But on the corner of the block uh, where we lived, lived two elderly single women. And my mother noticed that they were becoming more frail and couldn't go shopping. So she would send us up to get the shopping note when we would come back with the shopping note, she would do the shopping and then the sister after myself and I, we would have to take the box of groceries up. But because they had so little company, we were kind of a bright spot in their week and so they would always ask us to come in and have a glass of lemonade and we had to sit in the very formal sitting room and, you know, our feet not touching the ground and sit there very politely and make conversation with these these dear old things who just had no other company in life really and i learnt then um i learnt then about the loneliness of the elderly i learnt then about uh the need to look out for as neighbors to look out for those who might need your help but probably won't ask for it my mother really instilled my mother, my father was very generous too, but my mother is the one that organised that. And that's always stayed with me all in my political life right now, looking out for people who are vulnerable and offering offering assistance. That's been a strong theme in my life. And it's also, um, I lived in a very white, non-multicultural neighbourhood. So over the years, I've got to make lots of multicultural and multi-ethnic and Indigenous friends. But um, even so, as a child, to look beyond, I learnt to look beyond just my little suburban block. My parents did not go to church themselves, but they sent us to the Presbyterian Sunday School where... Um, I play, ended up playing the organ when I was a teenager, like, you know, hear the pennies dropping every Sunday. And I also went on to be part of our Presbyterian Fellowship. Now, that church uh, split in the maybe the 70s to a, a more traditional Presbyterian part and the Uniting Church, which was much more progressive. And I learned, without knowing it early on, that... The congregation elects the elders and I thought that was a very, somehow I took in to my way of thinking as a young person that that was a very democratic thing to do. Oh, I want you to hold that thought. we got to take a station break. But hold that, uh, the congregation, select the elders. Electing. We, 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 yeah, you know, so, so I'll tell you, as you see already, this is going to be absolutely fantastic. We just started. 
we can start now. You know, so whatever platform that you're watching this on, all you have to do is go to the comments, ask any questions that you like, and I promise to get you a message. It's your life. I'm Dr. James J.C. Cool. We'll be back shortly after the break. Welcome back to the James Cooley Show. It's your life. And uh, I tell you, uh, uh, just listening to the, the madams, uh, uh, just so far, and we didn't even, we didn't even scratch the surface yet, uh, is, is so wonderful because it teaches you a lesson. Uh, things that we learn from our parents, things that we learn uh, from childhood, things that we learn from observing help build the foundation that we live by today and helps us to get an understanding. We might not be in a certain type of environment uh, because we're not in that environment. Doesn't necessarily mean that we can't learn the environment and be participants and be of value. And uh, so, uh, uh, Madam Cheryl, uh, it's just an absolute pleasure to chat with you right now and, and you telling your story. And our viewers and our listeners out there, if you want to be part of this great conversation, all you have to do, Go to the comments. Ask this great lady, myself or Dr. Michelle, or whoever else come on, any question that you like, and I, I promise you we'll get you an answer. I want to pick it up again, uh, Madam Cheryl. You were saying that uh, you learn uh, by going through you know, Sunday schools that sometimes you learn things and you learn that the, the elders are, are chosen from a certain situation and, and that uh, kind of instilled in us certain type of values on how yeah. uh, our focus is. Can you pick it up from there? Yes. I mean, I didn't know any other. I didn't know the way any other church worked. So for me, it was perfectly natural every year to see this election happening in the in the congregation. And I think it, in, it just went into my psyche that it was both egalitarian 
and democratic. And those have been two really important values to me in my political life. And I didn't know that I was learning that at the time, but isn't it interesting that that becomes important to you? Oh, most definitely. So, you know what, let's fast forward just a little bit, a little bit. So, you know, we were doing our research and, you know, you were a school teacher. Uh, yes. and, and, huh? I'm sorry. Yeah, you were a school teacher, but then you entered into the world of politics. Can yes. you kind of tell us what inspired you to go into politics and, and kind of walk us through your path to parliament? Look, I believe that I had a genetic destiny. I know that might sound funny, but my maternal grandfather was very, very interested in politics, but he died when I was 12. So I never got to have any of those, you know, political philosophy conversations with him, which I really think I missed out on. But he was asked to stand for parliament apparently a couple of times at our state congress using your term level and he preferred to be an organizer in the background um i wish i could have asked him why but i just think i grew up i was at school i was interested in issues at high school i was in the debating team and chosen to give speeches I was just open to the world of politics and I I really do think that that has come from my maternal grandfather. So when I was a teacher, I thought that that was an incredibly responsible opportunity to engage the minds of those who would go on to do, you know, important jobs in life. And some of them were provocative and we used to have lots of interesting debates in classroom. But one day the state, what would you say, governor, I think, in your equivalent, closed down the state the state parliament. And I went along and asked to be let in. I was told that if I came in, I would have to stay till the debate was over. And I agreed. And I was looking down on the floor of parliament and I noticed that there were only two women. Now, I already knew there were only two women out of 89, Mm -hmm. But somehow that was not kind of integrated into my thinking about the parliament and the voices that were absent. So I watched this debate. It was about um, reproductive rights. And I was struck by the fact that so many men <laughs> were talking about this particular issue with no knowledge whatsoever and I, I, I think I had an epiphany. I, I just looked down and I thought, there's only two women's voices there. This isn't right. Um, we need more women in, in decision-making positions. In this case, for me, the parliament attracted me. And there and then I decided I could do that. I could do better than those people. I, I'm a woman. Our voices need to be heard. And that was the catalyst for me. You know, and, and I'm glad you mentioned that, um, that there, you saw there was only two um, women at the time. But as, as a woman, um, what are the challenges that um, you or have you seen other um, women in politics face compared to their male counterparts? Oh, well, fortunately, it's getting better in Australia. Mm -hmm. uh, the percentage of women uh, in our federal parliament is, well, in, in the Labor Party, it's 50-50. In the Conservatives, I think it's around 23%. But nevertheless, women in leadership positions is becoming a much more common thing. But along the way, they've all had their own stories of feeling that they needed to be twice as good as their male counterparts. You know, we have this argument in Australia that um, you shouldn't have affirmative action for women, you should only get there on merit. And then you would look at the parliament of the time and all the men who were supposedly there on merit and you would think, hmm, I'm not sure that merit is honest and works. So women... Women tended to get criticised for their clothing. People would look at how they looked before what they said. 
when I would be on television, the television channels would get calls saying, oh, where did she get her earrings or something, something, something. And I would say to them, did they ask what I said? And if I came across people in the street who said they saw me and I looked lovely, I said, and what did I say? And it was very disconcerting that people didn't as often as I would like them to remember what I had to say because I thought what I was saying was more important than how I looked. And women face that all the time. Women also are mostly the primary caregivers, so you have to have a very supportive partner. You also have to learn how to, um, you know, make sure you can still nurture your children because I know it's the same in, in America and here. The federal parliament takes a lot of representatives and senators away from home for many, many weeks of the year. And so I think women, women, women balance that. Uh, men so far have tended to have a supportive female doing a lot of work behind the scenes. So it's, it is an issue that Australia has addressed. We have had a very big conversation about women in leadership positions, whether it's in, well, the church, the progressive church that I was a member of, they've had women ministers for a long time. Our Anglican church has been having a long debate. The Catholic Church doesn't have women in leadership positions, whether it's the media, the church, the judiciary does, and politics does, but we've got a lot of catching up to do. We don't even have equal pay for equal work uh, as the norm yet in Australia. So we're conscious of all these issues and there are lots of advocates out there and we're making progress, but my goodness, somebody worked out that I might be over 120 by the time we get to 50-50 in the parliament. Wow. You know, and I, I know we're getting ready to take a break soon, but I, I just wanted to start this question. I know it's, it's a lot, but, you know, can you st start telling us about your time being the leader of the Australian Democrats? And I'm going to turn that over to Dr. James Cooley. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the Democrats are not as big as your American Democrats. We were a third party. Um, but the way the numbers worked out, it's not how it works in America. Um, voters delivered us what was called balance of power. In other words, the governing party needed our votes to actually get their legislation through the parliament. So we found ourselves as the the umpire, the amenders, those who sought to make the existing legislation better in order to give the government the, the, um, the right to include our votes. It was incredibly, um, what would you say, um, it was very responsible position because you had to understand all the pieces of legislation to make up your mind on it. But it was also... Um, it would draw the uh, wrath of those who didn't like the we, we we rather than the government would take the insults from the people who didn't want the legislation to go through. It was very uh, it was very it was quite onerous, very responsible, and in a way quite a privilege to actually be able to decide the fate of legislation. Wow, you know, so uh, we're going to take a station break, but we're going to come back and and, and I want you to tell. Uh, uh, our viewers and our listeners, what type of path it took to become the leader of the mm. Democratic Parliament in Australia, uh, mm. because uh, it, it's fascinating. So, but I tell you, this is this is fascinating. Just listening to you, just uh, getting to understand. I think you 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 teaching us history. You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, how do you? A bit of American <laughs> So we're going to take a station break. And if you want to be part of the conversation, I'll hit you. Let's go to the comments. Ask uh, Madam uh, Cheryl any questions that you like, and we'll get you an answer. It's your life. I'm Dr. James J.C. Cooley. We'll be back shortly after the break. So, really get a chance to know who you are. And once you know who you are, you truly know who you are, love who you are. Love who you are. You're a masterpiece. Love who you are. Love who you were born to be. Love 
Call me some me. That's what I'm talking about. When you leave high school, you got to know today or tomorrow, hopefully today, what your plans are. Hopefully, yeah, there is no bad decision unless there is no plan. Create, collaborate, commit with confidence. Commit with what? Commit with what? And everything that you do. Hello, welcome back to the James Cooley Show. It's your life, and uh, uh, Madam Cheryl, uh, I just, uh, I, I, it, it's just so wonderful. Uh, just uh, uh, you coming oh, on the show. Oh, that's that's my that's my buddy uh, Ellie. <laughs> it's it's so wonderful you coming on the show and just uh, the education that you. Uh, uh, just sharing with us is, is, is absolutely wonderful as well. And um, wow, I mean, I, I just got a question because we got uh, Ambassador Dr. Olivia uh, that's going to be joining us shortly. Uh, and so, uh, but can you tell our viewers and listeners, because they, they were trying to figure out, I know many of them trying to figure out, okay, what did it take? Uh, what type of path did it take uh, to become uh head of the parliament uh the democratic party and was there any challenges along the way that uh that you had to uh work through and learn from well you know how i was talking about electing elders the congregation electing elders <laughs> well we were the only political party that where the membership elected the leaders in Australia at that time. And um, so I had to, I was already in Parliament, in the Senate for a little while. I had to, I guess my pathway included uh, proving myself in that environment. And we had a leadership uh, affirmation or election after every election, every um, country's elect, every national election. So anybody could nominate and the mem then we would have to go around the various states of Australia um, speaking to the members, um, answering questions, giving speeches, and then the members would vote. So these days the party that's in government does the same thing, but they used to make fun of us when we started it. Uh, but it's now seen as much more democratic for members of parties to actually have a say in who becomes the leader rather than um, those who are in parliament only voting for the leader. So that that's, that was how I got there. Uh, the members voted for me. Uh, at the time, both of the governing, the major parties, the government and the opposition, so your Democrats and 
Republicans, both had male leaders. So I was quite a contrast in the federal scene. Um, and, and that was an advantage in a way because um, people watching the debate and watching television would see the two, I used to call them the men in suits, they would see the two men in suits and then there'd be this um, woman in brighter clothes um, also having a say. And, and I think the challenge was we were a small party, we didn't have as, much resource, as many resources or staff or all the rest of it, but that was a great way to become um, knowledgeable across policy areas, not just one. So the challenges were just in being relevant, in being followed by the media, uh, and we, we managed it. <laughs> you know, uh, in your bio, you, you talk about the Dixon, uh, you were a member yeah. of the Dixon, and a label shadow minister. For those mm -hmm. of us that are not familiar with that, can, can you enlighten us on what, what that means? Yes. So Australia is divided at the federal level, so that's at your um your you have a federation too so uh we are divided into constituencies or electorates when i was the member it was 80,000 voters and today it's about 120,000 because of population growth and then in that one geographic area within the boundaries they vote for their choice of candidate and that gets you into the house in the we don't have primaries uh, like you do in the, um, when you get elected to the House, there's the government and the opposition and shadow ministers, they shadow the equivalent that's in government. So you have to follow all the policies, make sure you know what they're about, whether you agree with them, recommend to vote for them or not, that sort of thing. Wow. You know, we, we got a, a very dear friend of both of ours that's, uh, that's here right now. We're talking about Ambassador. Uh, Dr. Olivia, you know, so uh, how you doing? How you doing, uh, uh, madam? How you doing? How you doing? I'm very good. Thank you, Dr. Cooley. I'm so excited to see um, Cheryl. On oh, the Olivia, fancy getting up at 2.30 in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> I feel so mean now that I know. I'm very it. familiar with that fireplace behind you and all those photos <laughs> on the mantelpiece. It's so nice to see it. Oh, it because I haven't it. been there for many years and I'm hoping to go soon. Yes. And, uh, I, 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 I want our, our listeners and viewers to know that uh, uh, Madam uh, Ambassador Olivia just uh, left the United States, to left here in Texas, and she just arrived back in the UK uh london uh maybe about three hours ago so it's <laughs> it's probably about three o'clock in the morning there <laughs> and uh yes, it's it just is, yes, it is. <laughs> but um yeah i'm super excited to uh see cheryl and uh, uh it's uh, uh an amazing show mm -hmm. and i'm also very very proud extremely to be one of the women uh that cheryl has supported to have a voice for other women like me from Africa. Uh, she, she did uh, a lot of work to get me to this confidence level. So I'm extremely and extraordinarily proud of this show. And uh, uh, if it wasn't the time difference, I would have brought on many more women whom, who are a result of what Cheryl has done with women in Africa including oh. myself. Can you oh. tell our viewers and listeners, how did you first uh, meet, meet Cheryl? <laughs> <laughs> we, yeah, Cheryl was invited as a guest of honor in a conference organized by the Sahara Communities Abroad. It was a, a not-for-profit charity organization in, uh, in, in the United Kingdom here in East London. East London. Yeah. And they were supporting uh, refugees from uh, sub-Saharan Africa. So I attended the conference. At that time, I was uh, a youth, I would say, much younger than I am now. And I remember uh, Cheryl uh, presented her speech as the guest of honor. And uh, I asked her a question. Yeah, that, I remember. 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> how do you, I think it was, how would, how would you achieve that or something? She was trying to encourage um, people from ethnic minority backgrounds that they can have equal voice, equal opportunities, and uh, they can achieve as much and, and and come up and stand out in society. So and I was me, trying to recruit you to, I was trying to recruit people to come to the School for Social Entrepreneurs. Yes. You stood up and I said, this is how it works and this is what you, and you stood up and you said, well, thank you for that. I think that's all very well and good for those who can do it, but how can a person like me get to yes. go? That's what you said. <laughs> I remember. That's right. uh, yes. And, and Cheryl said, um, she gave me her card, her, <laughs> her business card and said, come and see me at the, School of Social Entrepreneurship in Bethnal Green, London. And yeah. that's how we met. And then wow. you couldn't you couldn't get a scholarship um, to the school, but uh, we would seek scholarships from people to give out. And the woman whose father invented the Tetrapack, Sigrid Rousing, she would take... Um, CVs from us, but and she would choose some or none to give a scholarship to, and she chose Olivia for her work, yeah. the work she's doing <laughs> with sub-Saharan Africans in London, but also her background in Uganda. So Olivia had one of the very um, coveted scholarships to come to the SAC, and she earned it. And look what that... We must write to Sigrid Rousing, Olivia, and tell her what we've done. <laughs> We well, have about. <laughs> she would be so amazed at what her scholarship achieved. Oh yes, yes. Yeah. That's Madam, how we met. Uh, <laughs> Madam Olivia. Okay, so uh, all these years, and I mean, and I guess uh, friendship and and etc. Uh, I think uh, that uh, Madam Cheryl uh, probably know your kids and. And know your family and, no. and all of, all of Can these I things. Can I just tell you, interrupt you? Yes. My pastoral my pastoral care as a teacher ended up with my being her birth partner. <laughs> <laughs> For her first yes, child. Uh, I had not I think I'd not been to the school for two weeks or so and Cheryl called and I was in hospital at the King George Hospital in, in and um and Cheryl said, okay. And she came to the hospital and she found um, I had been in the hospital for a week plus and I'd been induced for almost, I think, eight days. Oh, My color so... had changed, yes. So she straight away noticed there was a problem. And uh, she, you know, she did. <laughs> we and saw we ended, we we ended up having baby Gavin. <laughs> <laughs> Who is that? You know what? After all this time, Olivia was exhausted. Her um, husband was exhausted. He was sitting yes. over in the corner with a cardigan over his head. And when little Gavin was born, I was the only one left standing to welcome yes. this beautiful little baby into the world. Oh, and yes. I am pleased to say that I think we have a special bond. Yes. So, and so. Gavin is 17 years today. Yeah. Yes. yes, and and Cheryl also was there for the birth of David. Who David, was the yes. Born. It and wasn't David, as traumatic though. <laughs> no, <laughs> and David is sixteen years old today. Yes. So this is part of. Uh, but the uh, I think what shocked the midwives and uh, the nurses was that I was uh, an African black woman, mm. and I was being looked after by, of course, typically you know, uh, uh, somebody like Cheryl, who is, you know, so it was a big shock. And she stayed in the hospital, I think, three or four days, yeah, not going did. back home. No. She ate okay. from the plates. We shared the plates of food with everything, yeah. and it was amazing, really. Everybody was wondering, am I from Zimbabwe or I mean, <laughs> how, <laughs> a white mother? <laughs> you know, but a uh, funny story, Olivia. In the midst of all this um, pressure on you and 
one of the midwives came along and sat on the bed and I said, what's going to happen, please? Because I was worried it was taking so long and they didn't seem to be taking it as seriously. And the, the midwife, the black midwife looked at me and she said, and who are you? And you said, she's my mother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and David, your husband said, oh, stepmother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway. That's the relationship we have, James. And wow, this so is life, so life amazing. Led, life led me, um, you know, to Olivia, and it's just just been the most wonderful relationship. Yes, it is. And the boys yeah. love Cheryl to, to I don't know, cloud ten. <laughs> and I speak to Gavin, who is a night owl. We have the most amazing, he's only 17, but he is so politically aware of the world. Yes. We have the most amazing conversations that I'm looking forward to for when my own grandson gets to, to that age. It's just wonderful yes. across, the, across the hemispheres and ages and race differences, mm -hmm. and we have the most wonderful time. You know, that's what, uh, and I call it, that's what love and life is all about, is being able to, uh, just being able to accept, being able to respect, being yeah. able to love unconditionally, regardless of uh, the differences of, of, of their ears. So, just listening to this conversation right here, and that gives me hope that the world, the world can learn to love and come together yes. and do great things. You know, so well, I hope so because we're very divided at the moment unnecessarily, aren't we? Oh, There's I, not I enough you. tolerance. It's just we seem to have lost a lot of compassion and tolerance in the world mm -hmm. at the moment. I um, one one thing that um, I, I think the call to leadership these days is it it's asking more of people than ever before, and I'm not sure that those who are listening. I mean, I was a great fan of um, Barack Obama. I I, I was watching that election until till the night, till it finished. I found uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt very inspiring in his policies. Um, uh, Olivia, did you meet Muhammad Yunus? Did you come to, like, I'm a very, Muhammad Yunus, you know, his goal of creating. No, I didn't in the field that I taught in and Olivia came to the School for Social Entrepreneurs in, there are different ways of doing things, but we're stuck in a very binary way of seeing the world. And the, I've written this book too, um, Australian Stories of Social Enterprise, because ultimately there's a role for business with a social purpose to change the way the world operates. So that's been... One of my um, my the decade the last decade's passion of mine to to meet people like Olivia for her to go back to Uganda to meet other and and um, take this knowledge of something with a social purpose but which can also be a business um, to challenge the, the the I suppose the current paradigm that is business is only there to exploit. And make profits for shareholders. There, there are other models which I find inspiring. This is so inspiring. We got to take a quick uh, commercial break, otherwise I'm gonna get beat up. Uh, we're gonna take a quick commercial break, but we're gonna come back and we're gonna pick it up uh, shortly after the break. This is so inspiring and wow! I would love to hear your comments. It's your life. I'm Dr. James J. C. Cooley. We'll be back shortly after the break.
Noah Dingley here, producer of The James Cooley Show, It's Your Life. And the new audio version of James' book, Country Boy, City Boy, A Journey That Ain't Over Yet, is a must-have. James shares his true life story of struggle and success in America. It's both a cautionary tale and a roadmap to achieving the American dream. Get the new audio version of Country Boy, City Boy, A Journey That Ain't Over Yet, by James Cooley on Amazon.com or wherever audiobooks are sold. Welcome back to the James Cooley Show. It's your life. And uh, wow, it's just uh, so inspiring, so inspirational. Just uh, hearing these two great ladies uh, chat. And uh, I don't know. I, I think that uh, I, I lost uh, communication. I don't know if you guys can hear me. Can you still hear me, uh, Madam Cheryl? Okay. You know, so we're down to about the last six and a half minutes of the show. We needed two hours. You needed two <laughs> hours. Of it, you know, but one of the things I, I want to talk about, uh, Madam Cheryl, uh, so you was in politics so long and you did a lot of great things and you know, working with the UK, working with a lot of things. How is life after politics? Well, it takes you a long time to completely switch off. Would you believe I turn the television on and watch <laughs> question time every day that Parliament is sitting because uh, I, it, it's in my blood. Politics, I'm very interested in policies and the arguments that are being put forward. So I haven't completely left it behind. But I'm finding, well, in between doing my Zumba classes so that I can finally try and stay fit as an older person, I have recently been made the president, I think you would call it a school board. We call it a Parents and Citizens Association here. And I'm the grandparent of children at the school, but the mothers and fathers are so busy just, you know, working to live that I decided to attend. And then after a few months, they've asked me to step up and be the chair of the board. So that requires me to do performance reviews and also make 400 pancakes this week for, <laughs> pajama, for pajama day. On Tuesday night, we have our next meeting. Um, it's, it may be much busier than I was planning to be. However, I believe in the future of public education. Our public schools do not get supported sufficiently well in this country. Um, I had a fabulous state public education and uh, I want to give back. I still want to give back to the community and volunteer and I'm finding this role on the school board as well. I'm, I do other things as well. I still do some part-time mentoring and lecturing. But in the main, I'm finding this PNC, this Parents Teachers Board, Billy, is, is taking up an awful lot of my time, but I'm mentoring a lot of fabulous um, uh, women who are mostly women are the volunteers of our society they're still these days, even when they've got, you know, busy family lives as well. So I'm finding that I'm in one of those um, mentoring roles again, and I'm not resisting, I'm not resisting it. Well, I, I got a question for you. So what advice would today's Madam Cheryl give to a younger version of herself? Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, well, I'm a risk taker. I have found out, I didn't know that when I was young, and I found that out probably in my 40s looking back. So I might say to myself, judge the risks. But I think it's part of my personality. Um, I look back now and think of some of the amazing things I, I did, like taking on women's cricket sponsorship, um, standing at the Sydney Cricket Ground, beating the drum to get more funds for the women. Uh, now they get equal funds with the men, which is which is great. But I'd probably say don't lose idealism because I haven't. Try and... There's a saying, beware of what you become in the pursuit 
of what you're after. And I would say that to myself younger than uh, when I discovered it when I was older. So that's probably what I'd say. But I would say um, embrace life, embrace your what you see is your genetic destiny, try to do good with it and leave enough time for friends and family. Wow. We're in the last minute of the show. Takeaways. Uh, what is uh, a couple of quick takeaways that you want our viewers and listeners to get from this great, great conversation with you? From me? From you, yes. Look for the good. Embrace life. It goes very quickly. Um, support intergenerational dialogue. I think that's really important. And don't accept the status quo because the way we have always done things may not be the best way to keep doing things. Wow. You know, Madam Cheryl, you have been absolutely fantastic. I would love to get you back on the show again if you <laughs> if your schedule permit. We we got so much that I, I would love to chat with you about. You know, so I want to thank you so much for taking time to come on the show. I I got to always thank uh, uh, Ambassador Dr. Olivia. Congratulations, 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 Doc. You know, uh, as always, I must thank uh, the executive producer of this show who always put together great, great shows. That's Dr. Michelle Cooley. And most importantly, I'd like to thank our viewers and our listeners for taking time to tune into the James Cooley Show. As always, always dream big, think big, and be big at everything that you do. We'll see you tomorrow. Same time, same place. It's your life. We'll talk to you tomorrow.